Hello folks, this is the National Museum of Military Vehicles, Part 3. Enjoy the video. Spark plugs and whatever you need, plus some mechanics to help put that stuff in. This truck right here, you've got this machine gun on the back of it, and the whole idea there is, is you're providing uh, uh, anti-air support. So if the German Air Force decides to attack you, you've got a little bit of things. Man, oh man, if, if you're part of the Luftwaffe, this would be a nice, big, fat, juicy target to shoot at. Although the reality is, is by the time we get to this point in the war, uh, the Allied Air Force is, is absolutely dominating the, the Luftwaffe. And if they send up one, any 109, we're going to probably hit them 551. Uh, so that's not a big deal, but it's still there. You got these big uh, tanker trucks right here. Each one of these tankers holds, I don't know, 3,500 gallons worth of fuel. And a Sherman tank. Uh, different Sherman tanks, different models, have uh, different fuel capacities, of course, but anywhere from about 100 gallons to maybe 150 gallons, and a Sherman tank is not a Prius. A Sherman tank gets about two-thirds of a mile per gallon of gas. Um, uh, so one of these, you can fill up maybe a, a company of 25 tanks and just completely drain this tank. And then in another 75 or maybe 100 miles, you got to do it all over again. Uh, but the thing is, is Europe is relatively compact, so it, it's, it's, it's not like you're going to drive three or four hundred miles and then fight. You're, you're just kind of moving forward in, in steps. Uh, I, I, I would be interested to know how much gas it took just to get these vehicles around that 700 miles, not including dropping off supplies where they go. But that, so this is, yeah, it's an impressive, it's, it's, it's a heavy lift. It's a heavy lift. So you got more vehicles in here. You've got ambulances here. Around the corner, you've got radio trucks. Uh, you've got a military police in the front, and they're doing traffic control and all that. I think this one's kind of interesting. What it demonstrates is, is it's just sort of a one size doesn't quite fit all. So this trailer is at a little bit of an angle because the trailer can fit almost any tractor. So it doesn't have to fit perfectly. Uh, it still works fine. But I understand actually the drivers kind of preferred this because it, the, 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 the weight balance is all shifted back further and that keeps the trailer from fishtailing quite so much. Uh, so yeah, kind of an interesting thing. All right, up here, these two are absolute workhorses. GMC, uh, CCKW, two and one half ton trucks, deuce and a half. Uh, this thing is, like I say, this is a workhorse. Um, it can hold two and a half tons worth of, of, of uh, equipment, stuff, uh, and that is that is about this right here. This is about two and a half tons worth of, in this case, fuel. Patton is not a glass half full guy. If he sees you driving down his road with a half empty truck, he's going to want to know why. So what we start doing now is... Uh, we're going to load this thing all the way to the gunnels. The problem there is, is since you're carrying five tons of weight instead of two and a half, you are absolutely destroying your wheel bearings, your transmission, your suspension, the rubber on your tires, your driver's butts, all of it. We don't care. We need to get the beans and the bullets up front. We got 600,000 of these things. We can replace the trucks. But we need to get the ammunition, the fuel, all that, the patent, the hodges in the front. Uh, so Patton said about the men in the Red Ball Express that these guys were absolutely unsung heroes. Uh, but he also said about the Red Ball Express that if it weren't for these men, uh, the war in Europe might have gone on another five or six months because we were able to, to not allow the enemy any respite, no breathing at, at all. We were able to put constant pressure on them. And then the guys in the Red Ball Express uh, had this saying that I loved that said, uh, Sometimes our trucks broke, but we didn't break. We didn't, we didn't step on that brake pedal. And I really like that. I think that's cool. All right. Come on. 44, the Germans are doing poorly on both fronts, both on the eastern front and the western front. And so what they decide they're going to do is they're going to take the units, they're going to cannibalize the units from the, the eastern front, from the, the Soviets, and they're going to put them on our side. And the idea is they're going to get a sneak attack, they're going to break through our lines, they're going to start uh, 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 capturing our fuel dumps, and they're going to fight their way all the way to the port city of Antwerp. Uh, and once they've taken Antwerp from us, now we can out 
we cannot resupply ourselves at all, and we'll have to sue for a ceasefire or something. And of course, it doesn't work that way. What does happen is they push back our lines against boats, and hence the name Battle of Boats, uh, but we're able to hold on. Huge oversimplification, but these two vehicles, of course, the Germans don't have their own Red Ball Express. So they run out of gas, they climb out of their trucks, and they walk back home again. Oversimplification, but you get the idea. All right. A relatively good, some of these big German tanks, you're looking at closer to 10 hours of maintenance per hour. Uh, my favorite vehicle in the whole museum is this one right here. Uh, it's that M18 Hellcat I was telling you about that goes 60 miles an hour. I've always just liked tank destroyers. They're fast. they got big guns. Um, but this particular one fought in the Battle of the Bulge. This is a, a, a Bulge veteran. Uh, but more importantly, for me anyway, is when this vehicle is being restored in Tooele, Utah, they get in contact with the guy who had been the original vehicle commander of this Hellcat. And he drives up from Arizona. He's 87 years old. His whole family comes with him. And the owner of the restoration process is saying, uh, you want to get in this vehicle? And he's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and if you see a picture of this 87-year-old man scrambling up these tracks, jumping in there, and he's in that commander seat, and he just got one elbow hanging on the side, just like he is so at home in this vehicle. And then the guy says, you want to take her out for a drive? It's like, oh yeah. <laughs> so the, the the guy is actually driving it. The owner of the, of the vehicle is actually driving this thing around, and they're cruising around. And you see the video, and the guy is he's got a smile so big on his head, it's like the top of his head's gonna unscrew because his, his grin is so bad. And then uh, and he you can see him. He's hammering on. He's pounding on the turret, and he just wants to go faster and faster. He's like a little kid on a roller coaster, just giggling, and it is so awesome. It is just so fun to watch. So that's my favorite vehicle in the whole world. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's look on this side over here. Uh, this is, this is of course, about the same time of year, but this is the other side of the globe. This is uh, Pacific Ice. Uh, this, this particular one we've got set up represents uh, kind of the Central Pacific, the Marshall Islands. This is Kwajalein Atoll. Uh, earlier on in the war, the way the Japanese were defending their islands, their, 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 their territory, was they would put uh, their defenders right at the, where the waves were hitting the beach. So those Marines, those soldiers coming off those Higgins boats, coming off those, those, those Amtraks, they're getting caught with fire immediately. The problem for the defenders is, is that allows us to use our Navy as offshore artillery. So our destroyers have 5-inch guns, our cruisers have 8-inch guns, our battleships have up to 16-inch guns. And we're just shellacking these defenders. Um, so... The Japanese learned to, to, to fall back and defend more from the center of the island. But they've also realized that what's, uh, uh, um, they're not going to win the war by force of arms. They're not going to be able to win the war militarily. But if we can make it so expensive in lives, so if, if, if y'all are going to kill me, but if I can get 10 of you in the process, maybe back at the home front, people are going to be a little less willing to fight. And again, might come up with some kind of a truce, some kind of a ceasefire or something. And of course, it doesn't work out that way. And part of the reason it doesn't work out that way is this, this mural back here. You see this Marine's got a flamethrower. Uh, it's napalm. It's the exact same stuff we use in Vietnam. Napalm was invented in 1942 by a company called Pfizer. Not the same company that gives you the COVID shots. Uh, but it is extremely effective. So if I've got an enemy who's holed up in a bunk somewhere, a cave system, I don't even have to get in with an apron. I just get in that cave, and it burns all the oxygen out of that thing, and you're still going to fix it. Now, the British figured out, and in their Matilda tank, they could actually fire a hot shot or a wet shot. And the hot shot is a flame, and you wet some all over the napalm. It's that we're not going to light it on fire. We're just going to shoot the fuel. And if you're a German defender and you're in some bunker, all of a sudden, oh, I smell like gasoline. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. I just, that's it. You win, Tommy. I'm done. Uh, so, yeah, the flamethrower is extremely effective. So you see there's a Marine sitting over there, and he's got a backpack set up. And then off his left elbow is uh, 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 an American light tank. It's an M5 Stewart tank that's been um, modified over the, the, as a flamethrower. Sir, you are the adult dude. It's like, 
school. I said, no, I should know that, so I'm not going to ask that question. Well, my fifth graders just, what's that? What's this? They want to know everything, and I think that's great. And one of the things they always want to know is about this goofy thing right here. All this is is a searchlight. It's a spotlight. It's for, it's for, it's for spotting enemy aircraft at night. And the way it works is not with, there's, there's no light bulb in here. Um, what you've got are these, these arc, these carbon rods that work kind of like an arc welding system. You pass a little electricity through there and you put a lot of light out. So if your standard, nothing special, 25 watt porch light bulb uh, uh, puts out maybe 125 candles worth of illumination, this puts out 800 million. <laughs> this thing is incredibly bright. Um, and of course, you got, you'll have a battery of six or eight of these. They're all attached to a generator and planes are coming overhead and you wave them around till you find the enemy plane. And then this big old gun starts shooting at that plane until it's gone one way or another. This is, this is that German 88 anti-aircraft gun. Being used for what it was designed for. Um, what I'm supposed to talk about in this area is this. I want you guys to look around. You see all the damage on the walls, you know, these, these, these murals here. Um, and for a second, just kind of think about material damage, the structural damage. Not so much the, the human suffering, not that. Just the material damage. Again, at the end of World War I, the Allies get together and they come up with what they call the Treaty of Versailles. And we're going to punish the Germans. Uh, you are not allowed to have an Air Force at all. Your Army, your Navy are limited to certain sizes or smaller. And more importantly, we're going to charge you war reparations. We're going to make you pay for all this damage. What that does is take, takes Germany already very shaky economy and just pulls the rug out from it entirely. Uh, the German economy plummets. It is in, yeah, free fall. It gets to the point where inflation is so bad that businesses are paying their employees daily. Factories are paying their employees daily because the 10 marks that I pay you today are not the same 10 marks that I'm going to give you tomorrow. Uh, there are stories of families taking wheelbarrows full of money and pushing that to the store to buy groceries. And of course, in this climate, that allows for this odd little dude with a funny mustache to step up and say, I can tell you who caused all your problems and I know how to fix them. And he does. Adolf Hitler brings Germany so far out of this abyss that in 1938, he is Time Magazine's Man of the Year. Because he's done so much. He's given the Germans a sense of pride. He's built up their military. He's built up their economy. He's built up their industry. So if he dies in 38 or 39, that might have been a good thing. But he doesn't. So by the end of World War II, we're seeing kind of a similar situation. But we don't want to create this kind of guy again. So instead of punishing our, the, 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 our beaten enemies, we're going to pick them up off the ground. We're going to help them out a little bit. And we institute what's known as the Marshall Plan. So General George C. Marshall who is the, 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 the chief of staff of the, all of the United States military during World War II. He later becomes Secretary of State under Truman. And his idea is, yeah, we're going to rebuild all these folks. So Germany and Japan in particular, but some others as well, with Marshall Plan dollars over a, pan, a span of about 10 years, so 48 to 58, we spend a trillion dollars building these, com these countries back up, which works out to be about $10.5 trillion by today's money. It's a big ticket item. I personally would argue that we got a good return on our investment. Both Japan and Germany became strong economic allies. They both became strong military allies. I would hate to think of what this, the, the Cold War would have been like with the Soviets had West Germany not been there. More importantly, these guys are big, big, strong democracies today, where before they were absolute dictatorship. Uh, changed them around 180%, 180 degrees. Excuse me. All right. Let's go around the corner over here. Car right here. It's a 1936 Opel touring car. Uh, it's a staff car for, for senior German officers. And if you look on this right side grill, on the front grill, there's a bunch of little dings and stipples and dents. And I will bet you any money, money, uh, any amount of money again that all of that is um, that was uh, shrapnel damage. So from an artillery shell, a hand grenade, something. Uh, that got a little too close. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going to come this way. I've got two more stops, and then we're... I need to point out the difference between this gallery, this uh, Puller Gallery, and what we just came through in this Marshall Gallery. 
uh, the, the puller is going to be a whole lot more immersive, let's say. Um, um, there's, there's, there's nothing graphic, nothing's going to jump out at you, but there's there a lot more sound effects, there's light effects, there's different things. In particular, we got a Huey helicopter that in the background of that is a helicopter sound is, 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 is on the audio behind it. And we wanted to do that, we wanted to have that sound, but 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 a Huey, nothing sounds like a Huey but a Huey. We didn't want to have just some sort of generic chopper sound. So for me, the sound of a, of a, of a Huey is nothing but a fond memory. Uh, but I know for a fact that that's not always the case with everybody. So if some of these things start to make you feel a little uncomfortable, uh, if you start getting a little anxious, if you need to sit down and relax, catch your breath, you go ahead and do that. Uh, if you need to fall back, jump forward, uh, any of that, do it, please. Uh, same map on the back side here. This little line is 38th parallel, and you got the, the, the north is being administered by the Soviet Union, and of course we're administering the south. And that word administrative army is key. Um, uh, we are not a main fighting force. We don't have big guns, we don't have big tanks, we don't have a lot of planes. We're there to make sure that the, 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 the roads are still open. We're gonna be there to make sure that they've got a fair and free election, but, but we're peacekeepers, we're cops. We're, we're, we are not a fighting army for sure. Uh, for a number of reasons, uh, North Korea is emboldened and they decide to attack. What they have, uh, some of the things they have is they've got good, good Soviet equipment. Some of these big Russian T-34 tanks. We'll point those out when we get there. But they can crush it across the line and they push us all the way down into this, what's known as the Pusan perimeter. We're able to tighten up our defenses. We get uh, reinforcements from Japan and from the United Nations. And we're able to uh, 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 strengthen this, this border. MacArthur decides he wants to have an amphibious attack of the city of Incheon. Uh, so you see kind of uh, north, just, just uh, uh, south and a little bit west of Seoul. He's going to attack the port city of Incheon and he's going to recapture Seoul, which has been taken, which ends up being taken four times by, by the North Koreans and by us. Uh, his, his seniors, most senior commanders say, sir, you can't do this. This is nuts. It's never going to work. Uh, MacArthur being MacArthur goes ahead and does it anyway, and MacArthur being MacArthur is successful. It's very successful. So there's actually a line from Seoul down to, to, to Pusan just to capture all these North Korean troops in this little part of the peninsula down here. We are pushing north. We go past the 38th parallel, and MacArthur just wants to take the entire country. He's gonna he he wants it from the from the southern tip all the way up to the Yellow River. He's going to control Korea. Problem is, the Chinese tell us by a third party group, uh, I think it was India, that if you cross the 38th parallel, we are going to counter invade. And MacArthur, being MacArthur, does not believe them. So we get all the way up. You see, there's that chosen reservoir up there, right up here. Um, uh, we get actually almost within uh, visual distance of the Yalu River. And 300,000 Chinese come across the border, followed by several million more. We've got an army unit that's virtually wiped up, wiped out up there. We've got elements of the 1st Marine Division that get surrounded. They're outnumbered by 10 to 1, but they're able to fight their way out. We get back down. Uh, the Chinese push well into South Korea. We push them back, and we kind of stabilize right here around this 38th parallel, kind of in a line, a little bit of an angle right here. And we just sit there for two years. Uh, giving and receiving casualties. So let's come talk about some of that stuff inside. Uh, this is, P34. Uh, designated as a medium tank, but that's you know medium light, heavy. It's a little bit arbitrary. Uh, but this is an outstanding tank. This was uh, one of the primary Soviet tanks. This is this is, is is responsible for destroying numerous German tank divisions. This is an outstanding armored fighting vehicle. You've got good thick armor on it. You've got an even better gun. You've got this nice wide tracks on this thing. This doesn't get stuck in the snow or the mud or rubble or anything else. This is an outstanding vehicle. And we're facing it with this right here. This M24 Chaffee tank, this American tank. It's a light tank. It's a scout tank. That 75 millimeter main gun on that is going to do nothing against this armor right here. It's absolutely impervious to that gun. 
the tank, the, the, the chaffee does have a particular anti-tank round, it's called a heat round, high explosive anti-tank. Instead of, when, when it hits, instead of the explosion going every direction at once, it, 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 it focuses it all in one direction, it's a shape charge. That will literally burn a 75 millimeter hole right through that steel. We have a total of five heat rounds in the entire Korean Peninsula at the beginning of the war. We're not prepared for this war. We are an administrative force. We got some bazookas up here. When you go out and take a look at these, the bottom one, that smaller one, it's an M9 bazooka. It's another World War II veteran. Our paratroopers loved it because you can break it in half and you can, you can bring it into battle with you uh, more easily. Um, that thing right there, the, 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 the ammunition on that, the rounds on that bounce off this tank. There's a story where one of these tanks gets hit with 22 bazooka rounds and all it does is chip paint and knock the dust off the gun. It probably annoys the crew on the inside as well, but it does no real damage to that tank. We are woefully, woefully unprepared. Boost on pocket, um, and, then, and then we have our breakout and we go to Incheon. And let's go talk about Incheon a little bit over here. Sand and Incheon. Uh, you got these great big sea walls because the tide fluctuates so greatly. Higgins boat. Higgins boat. Now this woman right here, her name is Marguerite Higgins. No relationship to Andrew Higgins. Uh, Marguerite Higgins here, she starts off as um, uh, a war correspondent in 1942. And she is with the military in 1950 in Korea. And we would call that kind of being embedded with the troops. It's not quite the same thing, but she was with them. So she, along with the troops, could shove further and further south into that, that Busan perimeter. Um, I want to meet this gal. She, she died in 1966, but I want to meet her. She is, from everything I've read, she's just a tough bride. Uh, she's smart. She's, she's self-confident. She's an excellent writer. She's an excellent photographer. Um, at one point, she's the only reporter for the New York Times Tribune. And they finally are able to get a male reporter in there. And I imagine the conversation something along the lines of, all right there, darling, it's time for men to do the real work here, so you go back home and make sandwiches for your husband. And she's like, oh, hell no. If you want to get me out of here, you got to pull me out feet first. She's tough. She's so tough. Um, and she stays. She sticks around, and she remains the, the, the reporter for the New York Times Tribune. Um, Hello folks, I hope you're enjoying these videos. This, this is the end of part three. I will be bringing you part four in about four days. Be so sure to hit the, the like and subscribe buttons and ring that notification bell.